Hello and welcome to Sex, Psychics and Psychedelics, Discovering Inner Liberation. My name is Banana Jane Garnett. I'm a licensed psychotherapist, a lover of freedom and a relentless explorer of the mind. Please come join me on my journey in hot pursuit of inner illumination and liberation. For more about me, you can find me at the Banana Jane on Instagram. Now let's dive in. Today's guest is EMDR specialist Mark Brain, a British psychotherapist who focuses on trauma, anxiety, depression, and relationships. Mark was a former foreign correspondent with the BBC and brings his journalistic precision and emphasis on radical curiosity to his work with attachment focused EMDR. I'm lucky enough to have been both Mark's client and his trainee. So I have direct experience of this man's next level use of EMDR. It's something that I know we both consider to be a game changing power tool in the world of therapy. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining me. Good to see you, Jane. Great to see you too. So we're going to dive in. And what I'd really like to do today is uh, make a kind of comprehensive piece about EMDR because a lot of people don't know what it is. And, you know, it's a hard thing to explain in a very uh, short nutshell, but I'm going to ask you to do that in a nutshell. What is EMDR? And um, how is attachment focused EMDR different from, um, I suppose, um, regular EMDR or the original EMDR model? Wow. Two big questions. Uh, Let's start with what is EMDR? as simply put as possible, it's two things. It's an understanding that we get to be the way we are and how we experience ourselves in the world as a result of formative experience in the past, um, which you can use the word trauma for, uh, big T traumas, big nasty things that happened, small consistent things that happened over a longer period, particularly in developmental periods in childhood. And the understanding that these are kind of wounds that sit in the system uh, waiting to be healed. Um, And that if we unearth them emotionally, if we access them, identify them in terms of emotion, cognitions, what we think about ourselves, I'm not good enough, it's all my fault, I'm responsible. And the physical sensation, the somatic way these past unmetabolized experiences are stored, that then the body and the nervous system want to heal is what they're programmed to do by evolution. It's just the the body does it and the psyche can do it as well. The piece that um, EMDR brings to the party is this slightly weird concept, uh, weird when you first encounter it, of bilateral stimulation where you use traditionally eye movements left and right, a bit like REM sleep, getting the eyes to go left and right quite fast. Or and it's equally effective in my experience, sounds or taps, physical taps on the hands or on the outside of the knees if you're working in person, or headphones if you're working online, which we do a lot these days. And this kickstarts the brain into a kind of semi-dreaming state, but it's a waking dream because the frontal cortex of the brain is online. And that facilitates turbocharges, if you like, the healing. Um, basically, that's EMDR. And I've trained in lots of different methods of psychotherapy and EMDR is absolutely the bee's knees. It really is just extraordinarily effective. It doesn't work with everybody, but you know, we've had some fun. I hope we've made a bit of a difference, Jane, in the work that we've done. Absolutely. The uh, your question about what's distinctive about what I actually prefer to call attachment informed EMDR rather than attachment focused. Um, attachment focused is a term that was coined actually by Dan Siegel, first of all, the legendary neurobiologist, a wonderful, wonderful writer and trainer, uh, when he came across uh, the way that Laurel Parnell, my very dear old colleague, Laurel Parnell works. And he said, oh, it's, this feels like a, a, a sort of an attachment-focused way of working. And she said, yes. And that became then her moniker, the stamp that she puts on the way she trains. Attachment informed is a slightly broader, and it's uh, an idea really is, is, that's that's coming. It's the next wave, I think, of the next phase of EMDR, really enabling EMDR to be as effective as it can be, understanding and really getting into the roots of how we get to be the way we are, as you know. <laughs> as I know. So, so know. it's really, um, it, it feels like it's much more focused on, 
on relationships. We get to be the way that we are through our relationships with other people. And that is completely stored in our nervous system. And the only way we can really get in there is by getting into the nervous system. And it's hard to, to do that by just talking. Am I wrong? Am I right? What do you think? Well, the talking is essential because we use words and we use gestures and we use facial uh, interaction to communicate. I mean, it's very well put that all behavior is communication. So words are really important. But also the dance of relationship is extremely important. The quality of the interaction, you as client, me as therapist, we're two human beings meeting in a shared sacred space, if you like, a contained safe space where, in a sense, you, let's just take you as a, as a you know, you're the client, let's say. Mm -hmm. You're coming into psychotherapy because you want to shift something. And the chances are you want to shift something about how you experience yourself today in relationship or it's usually about relationships, by the way, or with work or you know, the future or yourself. Um, and the dysfunction in that experience of yourself is rooted in stuff that's happened in the past, not necessarily big, nasty stuff, but just formative experiences. And there's kind of systemic experiences that are locked in the system where an old part of self is sort of still running the show. It's like an old friend that kicks in when we're stressed and takes over. So you come to me and you want to feel better. You pay me reasonably decent money um, and you hope to feel quite a lot better about yourself relatively quickly. And the thing about EMDR is that it's, um, it's not just relationship uh, between you and me. That's psychodynamics. That's person-centered. And it's very important, in fact. It's a necessary precondition for successful psychotherapy. It is ultimately the relationship that heals. But the thing about EMDR, Jane, is that if we get really focused tightly in, we, we, we laser in on those root formative experiences. In attachment-informed work, really informed by the primary attachment experience in the context mainly of mother, we're all born of a female body, and that primary relationship with mother, not just the, 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 the primary attachment figures in childhood, they're all important, but it's the maternal relationship, whether she's present or absent, we spend, up, spend our first nine months after all in the womb, and the quality of the birth really impacts on our experience of self. So in attachment-informed EMDR, we're radically curious about those early experiences and the felt sense of the dance between infant and mother. And where there's an absence of necessary experience or a presence of dysfunctional experience. And there's a lot of both with clients. In a sense, as a therapist, I lend you, I share with you my nervous system. Two nervous systems co-regulate, co-dancing with each other. I lend you my experience of presence to you to help find and fill in the gaps, the developmental gaps that you were left with uh, early in life. So, it, I, in my training, I've just invented a slide, a new slide in my training where I've got a picture of a rocket and I've got a picture of a cartoon figure of Einstein and I've put a big red cross through this slide which says, it's not rocket science. It's not, and yet it so, feels so magical to me having studied, you know, the, the traditional methods of therapy and then coming across this kind of power tool I just feel like you can make really big shifts quickly and I've experienced that both you know as a practitioner and and as a client and I feel like gosh how many sessions have we done together Mark um six not a huge number Jane I don't know six or something <laughs> yeah something and we've like had some six. pretty profound moments haven't we we really have I mean you've you've seen a lot of uh a lot of Jane, that's for sure. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. you know? It's all good. It's <laughs> all complex, but it's all good. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just amazing that how many layers there are. I remember um, someone telling me in the past, you know, healing is, is like, you know, an onion. There's always this layer after layer. And I was really annoyed by that because I wanted it to be a kind of a one and done thing. I was like, I've taken ayahuasca, God damn it. Can't I be you know, just done. Can't we just put a check in the box? Jane's fine. And um, of course it isn't like that. It is a bit like an onion and it m amazes me how many layers there are. And it amazes me how I feel like our work has gotten to sort of some of the really like, it's sort of like the sediment, you know, the stuff that's like deep down there that is also, 
you know, fogging up the lens. It's still fogging up the lens. The relationships of the past are still fogging up the lens. I mean, I doubt this ever ends. <laughs> but but no, I, I know no. I feel much lighter in that way. You know, having worked with you, I feel much lighter. I feel more um, more able to sort of start a new game, you know, in a way like create my relationships as opposed to just um, go about them in a, in a default way. Can I ask you, Jane, actually, just yeah. to, to put the boot on the other foot? Yeah, the, do it. Boot on the other foot. Um, whatever <laughs> the phrase is. If you want to boot it, that's fine. <laughs> You, you know, thinking obviously, I work and continue and have worked with lots of people over the over the years. And the detail, I'm sort of very much with the client in the moment, using a lot of creative intuition about what needs to change. And and perhaps I could just flag before I ask you the question I was going to ask, uh, which is that um, if people ask me, my trainees, my supervisees, you know, what is distinctive about the way you work compared to how I've been trained to work in ordinary standard protocol EMDR or in the modality, the psychotherapeutic modality that I've been trained in psychodynamic or person-centered or transactional analysis or gestalt, whatever. What is it that really characterizes, Mark, the way you work? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I've been at this now for a fair old while. I trained in EMDR in 2004, graduated as a psychotherapist in 2000 after 30 years with Reuters and the BBC. So I was a foreign correspondent till that point, but I trained in the noughties. Um, So qualified in 2000, trained in EMDR in 2004, uh, began to work in a very transpersonal way because that was my psychotherapy training with with a lot of dreams and metaphor and symbol and so on. And began to get some quite striking results when I got going mm. with the MDR. Mm. And I was sort of stretching the boundary, stretching the envelope from the word go. EMDR can be used as a very strictly defined protocol, standard protocol, you know, history taking, preparation, assessment, negative cognition, positive cognition, what you'd rather believe about yourself, you know, the validity of cognition on a one to seven. How true does that feel? Well, it's only a one because. I don't feel good enough about myself, whatever. Then the emotions and the suds, the subjective units of distress, and then where where we feel this distress, we're just stretching out to close the door here, Um, where you feel that in your body, and then you go with the bilateral stimulation. Um, And then you go through the installation, as it's called, and then the body scan, the closure and real evaluation, the eight standard phases of EMDR. It's a wonderful structure. It's a fabulous structure, first identified by Francine Shapiro in about 1989. And it stands the test of time. It's a very good structure to work in. But being transpersonally trained and being Asperger's, by the way, also being autistic, as we now say, so I sort of don't tend not to take prisoners and I don't get too bothered by clients' distress, as you know, Jane. Wait, what, do you, what do you mean you don't take prisoners? Well, I get stuck in. I don't dance around too much. You know, if a client's bringing a distress, mm. um, I, I sort of roll up. I say, should we roll up our sleeves and get to work? Yes, there's a literalness. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. And there's Absolutely. a kind of courage and a, and a foolhardiness at the same time. So yes. I started working very early in my EMDR career with um, intuition and dance and, you know, pushing the boundaries and getting into trouble with the authorities, the EMDR thought police on this sort of thing. Um, but the distinctive piece that I've discovered really works, and I think you and I in our work have found that, is it's as if we're rocking up from the future. You and I, adult Jane, me, I'm driving the car. It's like a, a DeLorean from Back to the Future with our flux capacitor, you know, and, and you're a Hollywood person. It's one of my favorite Hollywood movies is Back to the Future. So we get in the DeLorean and we shoot back into Jane's childhood. And we rock up outside your childhood home and I drive the car because I know how it works. You tell me where to go. And then you and I actually walk into the childhood home and we find out what's happening. And it's stored in your nervous system, in your felt sense. And we change it. We find out what little Jane was feeling and experiencing at the time, and we we fill in the developmental deficits. And it's a bit close. You said used the word magical. It's a bit close to magical. It feels sometimes. I mean, it. I'm sorry. It is magic. <laughs> <laughs> magic understood in a neurobiological sense. Well, you We're know, breaking even, spells. Even- 
listen, yo, you're bre- exactly. We're breaking spells. We really um, are. We really it's, are. It's liberation, you know, which to me is even better than magic. I mean, yeah. I think they're, they're akin to each other, but it is liberation, and it's you, you can only know it by experiencing it. You know, otherwise, you know, this could all be waffle, right? It could all be just like, oh, navel gazing. It's interesting to travel back in time and move around the figures of the past and have a good cry and all that kind of stuff. But what happens after it? is a feeling of liberation and a recalibration of how you see things in the present moment. And that is just fucking genius, in my opinion. Um, And in a funny kind of way, I think it gives credit to traditional psychoanalysis, which was always saying, Freud was always saying that the past informs the present. It's just that the whole model was so endless and so dreary. And now we've got this power tool where we can go in and we use our imagination. And that's where I think, you know, I think this is, incredibly interesting and I think this is you know where you really excel because you've got this kind of literalness and this matter of factness and this um thoroughness when it comes to gathering information in detail you don't leave stones unturned and that's something that I've been learning from you is to you know keep asking questions be more journalistic about it how old were you when that happened what was going on in the room where were you you know really and it's very literal that's questions. the thing isn't it it's yes, yes it's the it's actual story imagined or remembered and the two have an authenticity which means that you can actually rewire it you can actually sort of change the past not literally because you can't change what happened 20 40 years ago but you change the way the past is encoded in your nervous system so that the past yes. no longer drives the present and determines the future. I'm really thinking now, and we weren't going to talk about this, but I'm just really thinking of this example that we, uh, this moment we worked on from my childhood. I didn't think I was going to travel back there. I was telling you about, I think, um, some moment I had been angry in my present day life. You invited me to travel back into the past. I went back into a moment when I was six years old mm. and I was holding a Nautilus shell in my hand, one of those um, beautiful sort of very thin, it was like, I think it's called a paper Nautilus, very thin spiral shell. And I was squeezing it in my hand because I was very angry. I was in my new stepfather's office. My mom had just married this guy. My life had been upended. I didn't know how to express my anger and I'm squeezing this shell that I found in his office. And I love shells, you know, so it was sort of an act of, of self-destruction as well as like an expression of anger, you know. Um, and so I smashed the shell. You and, didn't intend uh, to smash it, though, did you? As far as I remember, well, you held it with an intensity, uh, a kind of frustration. I told you, it's a bit like that sort of mice and men thing. Do you remember with the, the Lenny and the, and the mouse? It's like It was like testing that edge, you know. Mm-hmm. what if it what if it breaks can it break should i you know do i have the strength am right. i bad am i bad you know am i this bad person and 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 so there was a there was a split that happened you know in my psyche then because i did break the shell and i did feel like that was kind of proof that i was a bad person so there were two parts of me from that moment right like the, the good girl i was supposed to be at the time welcoming the new stepfather going along with the new family plan and the part that felt wild and angry and like otherized by the whole situation. And what was interesting was that was, and this is the area that I find most rewarding and richest as it were. And it's a bit unusual in the MDR world, bringing the transpersonal into my MDR work and the Jungian, if you like, the the, the Mm. metaphors and images and symbols. I had this, when we were doing that piece of work, Jane, you also had a sense of out by the trash bins. I can't remember the exact detail, but mm-hmm. there was this mm-hmm. sort of male, quite angry male figure with hands that had chalk mm. on them. Yeah, there was an enormous, yeah, this was a dream that I had at the time. There was an enormous, colossal white hand that was blocking my path. I was trying to get out to the black trash cans, which was my hiding spot. It was kind of where I got to be bad in a way, feel my bad side. And there was this big chalk covered white hand that was blocking me, which I, until we did our work on it, I always felt was just this sort of nightmarish symbol of patriarchy. 
but it sort of reflected your distorted, your dysfunctional relationship with the masculine, didn't it? Where right. the masculine right. had been so negative. But in the work, I remember, because I worked very intensely and intuitively with the masculine and the feminine as well. Um, and the thing that fascinated me at that moment, it was a kind of an intuitive edge, was the fact that his that this figure's hands had chalk on them. Mm. And I don't know if you remember, it felt very powerful for me. I don't know if it resonated with you, for you to quite the same extent, but it informed my what we call interweaves in EMDR. So you go in, you do the bilateral stimulation in bursts of about 30 seconds, sometimes a bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter. And it turbocharges the brain sort of a um, bit like REM sleep. It's a semi-dream. It's a metaphor and meaning-making state that we put the brain into. It's not hypnosis. It's not an, It's not sort of altered state on ayahuasca, but it can be pretty damn weird. But what struck me was, hang on a moment, the chalk on this figure's hands um, is the same material as the shell. The shell is made of living beings, of crustaceans, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago that were laid down in these big layers, dead animals, but dead life forms. And you could sort of play with that, that there was a form of yourself that got stuck, that sort of died at that moment, metaphorically speaking. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And but you were, you were seeking to engage and have power and agency with this shell, not in order to destroy it, but to sort of have where these grown-ups are, are disturbing and taking all your agency away, divorce and new house and so on. And you're, there's this little girl needing to feel that I have power somewhere and the shell breaks. And at the same time, you have this nightmare experience with the masculine figure with chalk on his hands. The associations are just fascinating and we can't be absolutely certain, you know, in scientific terms, that this is totally 100% correct. But we explore the likelihood of the meaning and it seemed to unfold for you at that time. Well, this is, yeah, I mean, I think it's, maybe you can argue it as science. I wouldn't dare because I'm not a scientific thinker, but I would definitely argue that it's art and this is where intuition, you know, takes the lead. You putting those things together for me help me reconcile these images and actually befriend them. Now, this happened over time. It wasn't just like, hey, look at these images in a different way. You know, it, it happened through doing the tapping, staying with the emotion, and, you know, basically watching what happens. Um, but what happened was, and, and it did feel like sort of the masculine and the feminine coming to coming together, you know, the sort of the the broken feminine and the whatever, you know, toxic masculine, they started to, the the shell and the hand started to feel like they were in the kind of relational, reciprocal dance. Maybe they were two aspects of the same thing. Um, But the, the shell was restored in its beauty and the sense of ongoing life, which I think that spiral represents. And the hand transformed from being a image of prohibition and even almost like chastisement and became an image of protection. And that was huge for me. You helped me reframe that and see that hand as a part of myself that was trying to protect myself instead of this horrible external thing. One of the things that one of the dimensions and approaches to the kind of attachment informed EMDR which I find so powerful is to understand the dysfunctions that we carry the nightmares the flashbacks the internalized perpetrators even Mm. Um, every dimension every aspect of presentation a client's presentation all of the dysfunctions came into being with a survival informed benevolent intent. Mm. Kind is perhaps the wrong word, but that's drawing from um, NLP, the Neuro Linguistic Program, the idea that a part, however ostensibly dysfunctional, is there because it wants to help in the sense that those parts of you came into being at formative moments in early childhood as the only way you could survive at the time. And Gabor Mate puts it brilliantly, uh, his new book, um, 
mean, he's written some wonderful stuff. He's got what marvelous clips on YouTube. Any listener who wants to hear more about this, Gabor Mate, M A T E, um, Hungarian es- uh, extraction, living in Canada, a physician, now into his seventies. He captures this brilliantly that the in childhood, as mammals, as as the most helpless uh, animal on the planet when we're born and the leading for the longest period the attachment figure to keep us safe fed um, sheltered Um, the conflict between authenticity and attachment is a, a sort of central experience of the human infant and if there is a conflict between authenticity and attachment because attachment is literally survival critical without attachment i die I get eaten by a hyena. The predators circling the, the village will pick off the vulnerable and the young if they get separated out from the from the parents and from the safety of the of the group of the of the flock of the herd of the group. Um, the connection, the attachment to the primary uh, caregiver, is therefore life. Uh, I mean, it's survival essential. So authenticity goes out the window. So you, in your six-year-old experience and the build-up to it, you're in a new situation and you're left with a wound, with a a piece of unfinished business which cannot be metabolized in the relationship with your primary caregivers because your need is to attach. Otherwise, you die. You you starve. You can't look after yourself. You can't pay the bills and so on. So the price that we pay for survival is such that the parts that develop the aspects of self that develop early in childhood to get us through of course become later in life um highly dysfunctional and they continue to run the show with all of the sophistication of a six-year-old i once yeah, I mean, this, uh, worked, is, this is yeah. sorry well i was just thinking this is very you know this is very jungian really isn't it because we're talking about shadow and i think i mean i think we could justify this as as the same as sort of the, the shadow um, absolutely yeah yeah Jung was so, Jung was brilliant about this. He wrote so yeah, presciently he was about on, this. He was on it, wasn't he? he was and on it. and so we we all have to some degree that discrepancy between the authenticity and the the attachment, the atta- the authentic self and the the attachment adapted self. And of so course do we, we all need, need EMDR? <laughs> <laughs> well, we all need attachment. I mean, human beings yeah. are creatures of attachment, and that's why. Yeah you and I and anybody who goes into therapy, the primary things we bring into therapy is relationship, is attachment with with others. And there's a, a wonderful book um, by uh, Solomon and Tatkin, uh, Stan Tatkin, and forgive me, I can't remember the Solomon first name, but Love and War in Intimate Relationships. It's a fabulous book about the neurobiological dance between partners the millisecond by millisecond and we are each other's primary attachment figure in adulthood if we have the good fortune to be in a relationship that can, can, can survive and uh, survive storms um and the co-regulation this sort of lending of each other we, we we share our nervous systems with the other and that's what we do in therapy primarily it is the relationship that uh, gives that bedrock but then with these extra tools with emdr we really roll up our sleeves and we befriend the parts and say, hey, guys, you know, we really get that you needed to act out and be dysfunctional in all of these ways and you needed to break that shell at that time. Let's find out what the survival story is so that you can leave what belongs to the past in the past and take forward the good stuff into the future. Mm -hmm. The MDR is just awesomely powerful in distilling out what is adaptive and needed as we go forward and what can be with gratitude for the hard work that it's done, sort of put in the book and put on the shelf as a memory Mm. without the emotional charge attached. Releasing, releasing the past. So this is listening to you speak is bringing up. um, And I just found this out about you as I was combing over your bio. I was like, wait a minute, he got married to the same woman twice. And and (laughs) many... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and you're still married to her. And it was, I think, 35 years after the first time. Uh, we, and you're both we, the MDR we, therapists. You've got to tell we're me We're both about the it. MDR consultants now. We met, yeah. Jutta is German, um, and we met in Moscow when I was working with Reuters, my first overseas posting, in 1974. And she was a secretary in the 
West German embassy, what was still West Germany in those days. Of course, it was the height of the Cold War. So I was in Moscow for a couple of years and uh, we, we then uh, got back together again after I left Moscow and we married. Um, I was East Berlin correspondent for, so correspondent for Reuters in East Berlin, the other side of the wall in 1977. And uh, <laughs> Jutta needed to, she wanted to move her studies from Bonn to Berlin and said, I have to move to Berlin because I'm, my fiance is working in East Berlin and the authorities, the academic authorities in West Berlin said, ah, fiancé, schmiancé, when are you actually getting married? So she rang me and said, uh, I think we're getting married next month. So we did. Uh, it then came to grief, as these things sometimes do, 23 years later, and Jutta, with for good reason, she divorced me. Um, and we stayed, you know, constructively connected. And by that stage, we were both retraining as psychotherapists. She was about three years behind me on the journey. So she separated out and needed to do her own thing. I separated out the other way, uh, married somebody else who I met after the divorce. And that was a formative experience in its own right. We were together for 10 years. And then in 2013, <laughs> given who I am, I do these crazy things sometimes. I just wanted to spend the rest of my life with my the mother of my three children. <laughs> so I left my second wife and said to my first wife, will you marry me again? She said, oh, hang on a moment. Didn't I divorce you last time? I'm not sure about this. <laughs> um, and she said, give me time. And so we spent six months knocking around together. And she said, yes, I kid you not, Jane. She said, yes, on the top of Machu Picchu. I didn't ask her. It was in the in the frame. She just looked at me on the, literally on the top of Machu Picchu and said, basically, all right then. And we were married within six weeks. So we are now both EMDR consultants and passionate about this way of working. And sort of, it's a bit Hollywood, actually. It's a bit of a Hollywood ending where we have our moments, but we're actually living happily ever after, which is a bit of a turnout for the books with your first wife. This is, this is who, a who story of, you of 20 years high ago. romance. And, and I want to know <laughs> how much of the success of this story thus far we can attribute to EMDR. How much has EMDR helped you both in your relationship? It's a very good question. I, we, I don't think we'd be together uh, if it hadn't been for EMDR at lots of levels. Um, we trained both in EMDR separately, not knowing that the other was doing because we were not really connected through those noughties. And we, we began to reconnect because of family gatherings because of the three children and you know birthday parties and things. And I was always very fond of her. We were very civil and friendly with each other. But then we, uh, you, we both started rocking up at EMDR con national conferences every year. So we would go out for dinner and we'd sit next to each other listening to these earnest and inspiring lectures on EMDR. And a colleague of ours, when the first conference in 2009, that we both attended together. We were just chatting together at the end of the conference of the colleague who sells EMDR books, looked at us and said, invite me to your next wedding. We looked at him and said, what do you mean? We've divorced, we're not gonna marry. And four, four years later, he was absolutely right. So EMDR brought us together because it enabled us to work through, really did, to work through the crap of the past, uh, to really clear our own childhood stories. I mean. My my wife has a big German childhood story. Both my parents were born in India and they were children of colonial families and sent to boarding school very early in life. And so were sort of cauterized emotionally and did their best as parents, as most parents do, actually as all parents do, but pretty hopeless. And that's why I became a psychotherapist. Jutta's parents were pretty hopeless. War, loss, lots of big stuff going on. Um, and so EMDR really did help us clear separately our childhood clutter so that we were available to each other in a new way and we both clocked that's why our first marriage failed because we were carrying so many stories each in our own way from our dysfunctional formative past our attachment stories and it was only once they were cleared that we were able to connect properly and fight cleanly <laughs> love and war mm -hmm. in intimate mm -hmm. relationships um, and it's, it's a fascinating journey, Jane, because we both know viscerally, really deep down, that we, we were fond of each other, but we were so informed, so bothered, so triggered by unprocessed childhood stuff that we weren't able to make it first time round. And if, we're a, you know, if, if you want living proof that EMDR can make a difference, you don't have to be an EMDR consultant, though it does help, 
Um, Yuta and I are that, you know, you're on your EMDR journey too. And I hope you head towards a relationship that might be <laughs> as rewarding in its own way as we found ourselves to be. We're a lot older than you, of course, we have to say. Thank you. I, I would love that. I'll, <laughs> I'll take, I'll drink in the, that blessing. Um, and I'm curious, is it ongoing? Are there, do you guys get in a fight and you'll say, hey, you need to do some EMDR on that or <laughs> vice versa? It's interesting. The, the EMDR um, is, as I said at the outset, is both an approach to psychotherapy and trauma understanding to healing, to emotional healing and well-being. And, it's a, and it's, a, it's a technique. So the technique bit that is distinctive to EMDR, which I think is central when you're doing the heavyweight processing with somebody who's got a whole load of stuff that's unfinished from the past, is the bilateral stimulation. There's no other form of therapy other than walking, which human beings have done for thousands of years. You can walk to the Camino de Santiago. You know, you're walking along doing bilateral stimulation. You can run and dance and, and, and drum. All of these are bilateral stimulation. So the principle of connecting with powerful emotion and drumming and dancing, uh, human beings have been doing that since the dawn of time. Um, the, but the distinctive piece that EMDR has done, and Francie Shapiro, when she discovered the power of eye movements to bring down distress in her famous walk in the park in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1987, the thing about EMDR is it sort of distills the bilateral stimulation in a in a form that you can apply. It's a bit like willow bark, I think, which is the root uh, ingredient for aspirin. Now, human beings have known for millennia that aspirin um, reduces pain. And human beings have known instinctively for millennia that bilateral stimulation, running, dancing, drumming, uh, processes stuff, dreaming and so on. Just as scientists distill the essence of willow bark down into a pill that you can take, which reduces your pain. Shapiro sort of caught the essence of the bilateral stimulation and distilled it into a protocol, the eight-phase protocol, which enables us to apply that to people's distress, to clients, to, 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 to distress, in a way that resolves it efficiently and we know what we're doing. We know the neurobiology behind it as well. That's the brilliance of EMDR. But do Yutra and I do the bilateral stimulation bit much, much less than we used to? Once you've sort of cleared it, you don't need to keep doing the bilateral stimulation, the butterfly hug, like here, you can tap, 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 tap. Uh, in a sense, once you've sorted the, the fundamentals of the past out, not just understood them as in psychoanalysis, but you've actually processed them, you've worked through them, you've rewired them, you've repaired the wounds, uh, the unfinished, the... The, uh, the the rupture and repair stuff happens in life it's a rupture it's where it's not repaired it's the problem where we've repaired the dull stories they no longer run i could tell you so many stories about clients who come in with a particular challenge like learning to drive and we discover that i'm stupid at the traffic light it goes back to trying to learn maths math trauma as you america as, as it's called in america when you were a <laughs> seven-year-old and father was looming over you and saying you stupid girl and 40 years later, you're trying to drive a car and you've got that resonating, you stupid girl, and you freeze at the traffic lights. Don't we all have math trauma? Maybe this is the, the secret ingredient behind <laughs> not if you're Not if you're a, a male of, of my persuasion. I used to love maths. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that actually brings me to, can we talk about your Asperger's and how this, this plays yeah. into your story, your relationship yeah. and, and your EMDR experience? Wow, how long have you got? I was only only got a formal diagnosis. So. Well, we've never we've never spoken about this. I don't know why there's been so many other good things to get to, but <laughs> well, you know, I've always been I've, curious because you seem so emotionally literate. But isn't that antithetical to the diagnosis? The the thing about Asperger's or or autist or to autism, the old the phrase I now know is that once you've if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. <laughs> We're, we're all right. distinctively different, although we draw from the same smorgasbord of possible experiences of self in the world. Um, I only got myself diagnosed formally three, just under three years ago. Um, but as a kid, I was completely hopeless at relationships. I couldn't do friendships. Mm -hmm. and I was emotionally illiterate. I was very intensely emotionally aware and sad and um, 
and I had what and, and, and unhappy. I mean, I used to doodle in my notebooks at school and as a journalist, even as a diplomatic correspondent for the World Service, BBC World Service. I used to write in my notes, I'm not happy. I just doodled, I'm not happy. I'm not. I was just achingly unhappy, and it was a misconnect between self and world. And I just, Jane didn't know how to do it. I really did not know how to do relationship. And I could be experienced as being clumsy, impolite, uh, insensitive. And so people found me um, a bit hard work, to put it mildly. But I was highly functioning. I mean, I was one of the more successful BBC journalists of my generation. But I did burn out fairly dramatically at midlife at 40. When, to go into the great detail, I fell in love catastrophically with a Hungarian girl on a train coming out of Bucharest, having covered the Romanian Revolution, as one does. And that was not very good for my marriage. But it did blow me open in a, in, in a sense of becoming aware of my internal world and going into psychotherapy. I mean, we went into couples counselling, psychodynamic couples counselling, which was catastrophically useless. One of the reasons our relationship failed was by was psychoanalysis. It was so unhelpful and it was almost abusive, quite honestly. But the lights went. Wait, on wait, wait, me, wait, wait. Reading. Because because uh, doing it as a well, couple was catastrophic, or the it whole was it was all about the therapist and the transference with the therapist, oh. and so on. There was no attempt to explain. There was no relationship. The therapist, meaning well, did not climb in with us. Didn't it seek to facilitate a repair? And we were both left spinning in the wind. Um, there was an element of understanding of our story. But a year and a half just locked us into our into our distress. I mean, I really think, I'm afraid, this is a bit controversial, that there are dimensions of psychoanalysis that should be illegal. I think they're actually psychoanalysis. Well, I'd love to hear which ones you think. Are. Well, the, the, the absence of resonance, the blank face, the, oh, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the refusal of the therapist to actually engage appropriately to resonate with the client but to analyze everything and to interpret or i mean traditionally to turn their back on the client or to turn Mm, their back and be out of the whole (laughs) point is that people come into and my wife and my 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 personal journey of of asperger's is all about relationship and and not being felt Uh, dan siegel has this lovely phrase that in our relationship with our parents to start with and then in adulthood and actually in our friendships we need to feel felt Mm. such a powerful powerful sense to feel felt to have a kind of visceral sense that this person feels me i exist in their internal world they resonate it's very sort of good vibrations it's a resonance of two nervous systems with each other and that is the healing because that is where so many of us come into therapy in later life or in midlife where there's an absence of necessary resonance with our primary attachment figures. We either had the presence of dysfunction in those attachments or the absence of necessary function. And so this both repairing the wounds, but also filling in the gaps. And my Asperger's, which I now understand, I only wish it had been diagnosed you know, much earlier, but in the 1950s, people haven't even heard of autism, even though Hans Asperger, working in in Vienna in the late 30s and during war, during the war, uh, he was the first first person, really, was the father of all of the understandings of autism. And uh, he was uh, he hadn't yet become widely known. That only really happened in the 1970s and 80s. It's relatively recent. But my goodness me, if if the grown-ups in my life, just as one example of a, somebody with Asperger's, had clocked and been able to say, ah. Oh, we get it. We understand you. You are the way you are and you're struggling because it's the way your brain works. And it's not because you're a bad person. It's just you and it's okay. It's a bit like dyslexia. You know, the, 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 the taboo, the kind of shame around dyslexia lifted before it began to lift around Asperger's. So it's been, a, it's been an amazing journey, actually, Jane. Um, and I think it, it gives me ways of working in, in therapy, particularly with EMDR, which is very structured. And it gives me a containing frame in which to actually get results. And I think my Asperger's and my experience of autism and, and EMDR are a bit of a sort of match made in heaven. Perhaps it helps me be reasonably effective. I, I feel that it does help. And I think some of the reassurance I've received from working with you is this sense of, well, the attention to detail and this idea that everything has its place, which is 
uh, not always the way that I've operated. It's been more of a sort of like the universe is kind of a fuzzy, <laughs> fuzzy place that you sort of buzz around and you do your best and you basically wing it, you know, and, um, and working with someone who has a sense of order and the idea that, you know, it's basically all a jigsaw puzzle and, and every piece can find its place. Mm, um, it's very reassuring. Can I ask you, you know, as I know mm. we're approaching the end of our conversation, mm. but as a fellow EMDR therapist, mm. I'm curious what you have taken from your personal experience of working in this structured, focused uh, way for the impact that it's having on your work with your clients. How is my work with you affecting my work with clients? Mm. The learnings, yeah. the sort of the the emotional shift that we've managed to perhaps bring help mm. bring about in you, but also your sort of experience of a kind of different way, a deeper way of working with the, with the basic structures mm. of EMDR, which you learned mm. on your basic training. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think on a sort of emotional, spiritual level, I feel um, a confirmation that this work is really powerful and really valuable. I, that's hundred percent clear to me. I mean, it was, it was my hunch before when I trained and practiced and then I did your training and work with you and, and I feel like, hell yes, this is absolutely great stuff. It's, you know, it's as powerful as psychedelics, but much more orderly, and, um, which is my other, my other power tool, psychedelics. Um, but this is, yeah, this is work that is both structured and, and highly imaginative. So I'm sort of, blown away by those um, two aspects of it. In terms of my own application of the work, um, I've become more rigorous with detail. I've learned that from you. Um, I gather more information from my clients. I take it more sort of seriously and more literally, if that makes any sense. It's less floaty, very good on intuition and moving around and very good on empathy, but that doesn't lead as much now. I think maybe I'm a bit more scientific in my approach, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing given the way that I skew. So um, it's really great for me to have a, you know, I've got, I feel like more of a sort of rigorous and defined working model as well as more validation on an experiential level that working in the transpersonal realm, working with personal symbols is the bee's knees to use one of the phrases. We like it. It, it is to me, it's the most exciting thing because that's, that's, that's poetry. You, you know, to get into the world of universal symbols is, um, gosh, why does it excite me so much? I, I don't know. Maybe you have an idea. Meaning and purpose, you know, we are meaning making meaning. machines. It, it brings, meaning. it brings yeah. a kind of fizz and excitement and a depth. Mm. To, 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 to us. And what a privilege it is to be working as a EMDR therapist with clients who bring these oh my extraordinary God. stories and we it's can actually, really make a difference. Yeah. No, exactly. And, and I think that's, um, brings me to two more things I, I, I want to touch on. Okay. Epigenetics, the idea that we can work on something that has happened in the past that was highly traumatic actually shift things on an epigenetic level so i know you and i wound up doing some work where this was not intentional but all roads lead to rome we ended up talking about my grandfather's assassination which was a radically traumatic event um my my grandfather was was stabbed to death when my mother was just a small child and it was a, a terrible trauma and um and you know it's hard without really kind of getting familiar with this work to really sort of see how directly that informs your whole nervous system. But when you do the work, you see, oh, it, it does. And the experience of being able to process some of that shock and grief that has been passed down epigenetically, and I don't know if I've completely put it to rest, but certainly in that experience I had with you, I felt like I really, you know, calm something down deep in my nervous system and my hope is that that in turn would also help my mother and my grandmother who's passed and then also my daughters and I mean I think it goes in both directions what do you think absolutely one of the things that um are two things two 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 key things perhaps to flag up in, in answering that really very important observation one is that we talked about magic earlier on and in a sense, human beings have known 
through the millennia since re written records began that stories, spells, if you like, that are cast on a particular generation or an individual get passed down the line. Uh, the Bible in uh, phrases, uh, pieces written up to 5,000 years ago, has the phrase in, 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 in Genesis that the sins of the father are passed down to the third and the fourth generations, I think it says there. Um, and so many wisdom traditions and religious traditions throughout human history have this idea that uh, the concepts are different in the different in the different traditions, but the idea is like a spell or an evil spirit or whatever that gets passed down, that gets cast. Think of fairy tales that have the metaphors in most cultures. The idea of a spell is very central to the human experience. We now understand that these spells, as they used to be understood, are sort of neurobiological patterns that are burned into the system, which can actually be released. They are... They are scientifically understandable. They're not external, and I don't understand them as evil spirits out there. But through through history, cultures have found ways of working with these stories that get handed down to release them so they don't continue to, to haunt the present by understanding them as evil spirits might be cast out, exorcisms and so on. But, of course, we now know, and yet Rachel Yehuda in New York is doing amazing work on the epigenetic transmission of trauma sensitivity down through through the generations she's worked with um, holocaust survivors and families of and um, uh, with 9-11 uh, people who were exposed to 9-11 in new york and there's a very clear scientific marker epigenetics is you have you have our genes and then the epigenetics is how the genes then fire and wire um, and there's definitely it's definitely clear that some of this is passed down in epigenetic form but of course a huge amount is passed down in what, in terms of what Richard Dawkins would call memes, cultural ways things are talked about and communicated with children. So we're soaked in the stories, genetic and cultural, and family and 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 and, and group and identity. We're soaked in this. We're marinated in these stories as childhood in, in childhood. And the brilliance with the MDR, with attachment informed EMDR, with what I call the intergenerational approach the intergenerational protocol i hate the word protocol because it sounds like just what you do out of a box and it's the same with everybody we go in and we actually uh, invite the client as it were to in we, we take we go into the client's childhood story and we invite them to imagine their mother their father their formative attachment figures um, having their experience you know, they might be shouting at the child. They might be divorcing, having relational difficulties, the sort of stories that we explored. But then we sit in the client's imagination. We sit the mother down and the client is my interpreter. And I sit in front of her, in, in, of the mother or the father, in the client's imagination. And then through the client, through the adult client, not the child client, through the adult client, we then ask the mother, the interject, as we say in, in, the, in the psychodynamic jargon, we ask the mother to drop back into her childhood or the father to drop back into his childhood. And then we might go further back and we find, mm. you know, your grandfather having the, having the experience of violence and the impact on the family system. And it really is, Jane, isn't it? It's, it's, it's weird. When client says that's weird, we know EMDR is working. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. It really is true. We and love we weird. release yeah. these intergenerational, these yeah. sort of generational yeah. stories you could get very woo-woo about it, but I think it's actually in the quantum experience of the nervous system that these stories are still resonating and we release them. We give permission to the old stories. Hey, you've done your bit. It's been carried for, with survival-informed intent. It's okay, guys. You can go now. And thanks for all your hard work over the years. Absolutely. I mean, it's like the deepest kind of experiential narrative therapy it's about as deep as it goes. Could, I was working with a Jewish, with a couple of Jewish clients recently, and one of them, we went back to the, because um, I love working with Jewish clients because there's just so much history, you know, and there's Jewish mothers, and there's all the cliches, well, most of which are true. Um, and the um, we went back to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70 with one client. With another Jewish client, we found ourselves with Moses in Egypt. I mean, please it was we when we realized that was where we needed to do the healing 
because she was car- the, these two clerks were carrying these stories in their in their DNA, and we released something that needed to be released. It's incredible. I mean, it I. Is. I- feel like this, I have another question that I feel like we should just hit on, even though ideally I would have asked this at the very beginning. But I think, you know, it's important to address the fact that, that EMDR covers a range of, of trauma from the big T to the small T. I think you have a better definition than that. But I think I just want to hit on that because we've been talking about the intergenerational. We've been talking about the attachment. We haven't really been talking about the, you know, the car the crash. or the, Yeah, mm. exactly, exactly. Well, EMDR is, is, is exceptionally effective at clearing um, the impact on the nervous system of big, nasty, big T, nasty stuff, a, a mm. rape, an mm. assault, a, a, mm. a bomb attack. The brain and the nervous system want to heal. The body wants to heal. The body is programmed by evolution to heal. It's doing it all the time. The white blood cells are just checking out. You, know, you, as, you as we're talking now, our bodies. 55 to 80 trillion cells trundling away and they're all the basic job they're doing is, is surviving and healing where there's any r- r- ruptures and things that aren't so good they're going in and repairing that's how it works and trauma what trauma does and trauma is a very big word which isn't always helpful because we're sometimes just looking at looking for formative experience that might not look or even feel like trauma but what trauma does, if, it's, uh, if we understand trauma as a, a moment of overwhelm of the nervous system at a formative, vulnerable time, moment in life, particularly early in life, when we're very, very impressionable and we're learning how to be in the world and observing and experiencing our parent uh, attachment figures and our siblings and school and teachers and things, um, if our nervous system is overwhelmed, the, 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 the thoughts, feelings and physical sensations get stuck because they can't metabolize, they can't be digested. So they get blocked off, they get locked away. And the attachment stories might get laid down, the dysfunctional attachment stories might get laid down in effect, Jane, in trillions of moments. This is the interesting thing. It's not just this big thing that happened, that nasty thing that happened, that event. Because the, the, the amygdala, the key piece of the brain kit that checks in checks all incoming information safe not safe saber-toothed tiger pussycat it filters stuff through and fires the adrenal glands up if it's if if there's might be a need to fight or flee or fight or flee it's working at the millisecond at the nanosecond level it's it works so fast so your amygdala right now and mine are just filtering everything that's coming in safe not safe yeah not too bad not too bad that's a reasonably decent question you know, she seems reasonably friendly. I'm not. Just, I'm not about to be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> you don't know. But the, ex- yeah. <laughs> the experience in childhood can overwhelm, uh, and where there is an absence of repair to the difficult stuff that they're just being very frightened, being the big loud noise, the thunderstorms. Um, there's a dog. Uh, the, I was pushed off my bicycle at school. I'm very sick and have to go to hospital. So many things happen in childhood. Where that has overwhelmed the nervous system and wasn't modulated, wasn't metabolized in the dance with the maternal attachment figure, mainly primarily mother, but others too, where that's still in the system, EMDR is absolutely brilliant at rooting it out, clearing it out, so that the wound can heal. Trauma, after all, is the Greek for wound. So EMDR is very good with obvious trauma. We're now discovering it's absolutely brilliant with not just clearing the debris, but actually rewiring the absent necessary experience. So with the bilateral stimulation, imagining the childhood experiences you should have had. Once you've found the wounded child, she's told her story, she's told that she's wept in adult body about the breaking of that shell. Then we go in and we work with mum, we work with dad, maybe with a stepdad. We clear bits and pieces to the best of our ability. The work you and I have done with your mum, I think has been, really touching you know, up in Scotland mm. and other things perhaps we don't need to go into. But the you carry your mum, you know, with all of her defects, all of her best intentions, all of her failures as a mother, all of bits and pieces she got right. You carry her in you. We all carry our mothers to, to our dying day and who knows, possibly beyond. And that mother, we can actually work with that internalized mother and help her be, help that part of ourselves be the parenting and mothering experience form adaptive helpful healthy that we didn't have as a child and that is pretty damn close to magic it's so worthwhile doing this work 
Mm, makes me think of, of Russian dolls kind of going in both directions. <laughs> you know? That's right. Yeah, um, it's incredible. And I know that you, I mean, this would probably be a whole other podcast, but I know that you've been working with couples as well. I'd be very curious about that. EMDR with couples, Jesus. I love that. Yeah, I love working with couples. Amazing. Should we keep that for another podcast? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, yeah, I just want to close with any wish that you have for for this work that you're doing for EMDR in general. Yes. Uh, well, two things I might say. First, I do think that this EMDR is a game changer. It really is in its own right. I think the attachment informed way of working with EMDR is an, uh, is, is an is a double game changer. And I think, I do think, and I hope this doesn't sound too arrogant, and I do need to credit Laurel Parnell enormously for having taken EMDR in this direction and Francine Shapiro for having invented EMDR in the first place. So anything that I do, uh, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants, <laughs> as we all do. So I'm developing, we're all magpies. We all pick things up here and mm. cobble it together there. But I do think that this focused way of working with EMDR, I think it's the future of EMDR. Um, but the proof will be in the use and in the enthusiasm. And if, does it catch fire? I hope it does. The second thing I'd say is that we live it in extremely uncertain times. I follow the science of climate change exceptionally closely, and I'm afraid to say that we are, um, the next two or three decades are going to be very, very difficult indeed. And what can we do as therapists? We can't turn global heating back. We can't do that. But what we can do is work with one soul at a time. And if there is to be hope for humankind for life on this planet in the longer term we as human beings need to manage ourselves on this planet very differently you just need to look around ukraine fossil fuels consumption poverty you name it um the the loss of biodiversity the extinction of species i mean there's so much that's happening at the moment the question might be asked well why are you working as like a psychotherapist to work you and i doing our work together to make the blindest bit of difference possibly but who knows? I can't change the science of, of CO2 and climate change, but I can work one person at a time and see if we can make a difference with people who can begin to do the right thing in the future. So I think it's worth it. I completely agree. I think by, by clearing the past, we clear a pathway to a potentially new future where we're not just repeating. Um, Mark, this has been amazing. I could talk with you for so many hours about this. So thank you, well, thank thank you for, for helping me. Close. Me. <laughs> it's been, so, it's been a really, so really rich conversation. Thank you. Oh, it's been so rich. And, and tell us, uh, lastly, where can we find you if you want to be found at all? <laughs> well, I'm going off on a sabbatical on my bicycle. Uh -huh. Jutta and I are going to go and cycle around Germany while stocks last. Uh, we've electrified our tandem. We're, we're keen tandem riders. Uh, so we shall climb on our tandem and go around Germany in the spring and summer of next year. But uh, I can be found at emdrfocus.com and uh, brain by name, brain by nature, B-R-A-Y-N-E. Why it took me so long to realize with a name like that, of course I've got to be working with, you know, with trauma and how yeah. the brain works. <laughs> Hence my other website, brainwork.com, B-R-A-Y-N-E work.com. And I'd just say as a, as a final comment from myself, Jane, I'm, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's such fun working with you. Um, and all power to your elbow in taking these ideas out and on the American West Coast in particular. But I do love working with, with the Americans. I know you're a Brit, but I do love working with American culture. There is so much can do, so much willingness and enthusiasm and openness to learn. It is so refreshing. So and we need you. your we need your humor and candor and precision and wit. So let's work together. <laughs> I say we like I'm an American now. Jesus Christ! Look what you just did to me. Um, all right. Many thanks. Many thanks. Thank you.